Welcome to this webinar. Before we begin the presentation, I want to provide you with a few housekeeping items. On your screen, you will see a taskbar with icons. Each icon is assigned to a particular element of today's webinar. Click on the person icon to learn more about today's speakers. Throughout the presentation, you can network with others or submit questions to the speakers in the Q&A and chat box next to the slides. Download resources from the cloud icon. After the webinar is over, please take our survey to tell us how we did. Today's event is being recorded and archived and will be available within 24 hours. For on-demand questions or comments, send us an email by clicking Need Help? Email us. If you experience any technical issues today, please refresh your browser by hitting F5 for PC or Command R for Mac. And now I'm excited to turn it over to today's moderator. Good afternoon and welcome to this webinar, Tackle Mold with New Technologies. This event, brought to you by Restoration and Remediation, is sponsored by Goldmore. I'm your moderator, Sarah Harding, Group Publisher of Restoration and Remediation. Thanks for joining us today. Today's presenter is Brett Salee. Brett has over 30 years experience in the mold, fire, water restoration and construction industries. He holds certification in mold remediation and inspection. He currently serves as a national trainer and sales representative for Goldmore USA. Please don't forget to submit your questions, and later in the program, Brett will address as many as possible. Today's event is being recorded and archived on rnrmagonline.com backslash webinars. And now I'm excited to turn it over to today's presenter, Brett. Hey, thanks so much, Sarah. I really appreciate that. And we want to welcome everyone and thank you again for attending today. I know you're, you're all busy people, so thanks for uh, carving out a little bit of your time for us. Hopefully, uh, you'll hear some things that are informative and will help you in your mold remediation efforts. So let's take a, a quick look at uh, just an overview of what we're going to cover today. Uh, first of all, we're going to be talking a little bit about what is mold. Now, obviously, we're not going to get too in-depth here. That would be uh, quite a lengthy multi-day seminar. But we do want to address a few uh, facts about mold in terms of what is and isn't important to us as mold remediators. What will help us do a better job, determine what type of protocol we need to follow, uh, so on and so forth. And then along those lines with protocol, we're going to talk about some of the traditional protocols that are out there right now, uh, what's being done in terms of mold remediation, and then how can new technologies help us to become better remediators and restoration experts. And, and that's kind of the key. Are we remediators and restorers, or are we just demolition contractors? And the uh, new technologies can help us uh, to be the former. And then we'll talk about the Goldmore solution, how new technologies are changing mold remediation, and how these technologies can help us, again, with more modern, up-to-date uh, protocols and getting the type of results we want, for ourselves, for our customers, uh, for everyone involved in the uh, mold remediation project. And then finally, as Sarah mentioned, we're gonna have a question and answer session. Look forward to that. We wanna leave as much time as possible. Uh, hopefully as we go through the presentation, it's gonna trigger uh, some questions in your mind and we'll be happy to try again to answer as many of those as possible uh, that time allows for. All right, so let's get started with our first little topic on what is mold? I thought what, the way we could start this is to watch a little video presentation, uh, a representation, if you will, about what happens on a microscopic level when mold colonies are, are growing and trying to expand the horizon, trying to search out and look for, uh, for new areas to start growing. So let's watch that brief video. And what this is, it's actually a, a representation of Aspergillus penicillium. Uh, in again, at more of a, a microscopic level, uh, as different things impact the colony, whether it's uh, air movement or some other time that type of outside source comes into play, as you see, the spores start spreading around. Uh, a lot of people, when they see this video, first thing they think that, well, I know I did when I first saw it, is uh, dandelions. And when we're kids, maybe we don't do that anymore, maybe we should more often. But we'd pick those dandelions, were white, blow them, 
and those seeds would go everywhere. And that's analogous to what happens with mold. I mean, obviously, we're not talking about seeds with a plant, but we're talking about mold spores. But again, that's how it reproduces itself. It sends those spores out into the environment, carried on the winds or whatever else is circulating uh, through that environment, sending those spores and starting new colonies. As you'll notice here in just a, a few moments, here you'll see the hypha or root structure represented and how, it, again, they spread out kind of like rhizomes on a, on a uh, strawberry plant, sending out, again, new root structures. And this is what oftentimes is digging in, even though it's not very large in terms of what we deal with day to day, but these root structures dig into surfaces, perhaps uh, wood surfaces, the paper that's on drywall and different things. And that's one of the things that can make it sometimes so difficult uh, to get out. But as it shows here as it backs out of this picture, mold is just everywhere uh, within the home environment. All right, so what is mold? What are some facts about it? First off, it's everywhere, mold. 25% uh, of the Earth's biomass is made up of mold. So we're never going to get rid of all of it. Uh, nor would we want to. There are many beneficial aspects to mold. But what we don't want and what our customer doesn't want is to have mold in our building environment to an elevated degree. We don't want it visually, to be sure, but we also don't want it floating around in the air more than is absolutely necessary. Now, as far as what mold does or how it grows, it has the same basic requirements that humans have in order to survive. First of all, it needs a food source. Unfortunately, in a home environment, there's not much we can do about, as remediators, about denying its food source. Uh, most of the, or a lot of the structural elements within the home are a food source to it, uh, especially if any of those elements were ever you know, organic, such as you know, wood that's in the home, uh, again, paper on drywall, fabric as that are in the house, uh, upholstery, and so forth. So the food sources are there. We can't really do much to control that. Secondly, mold requires oxygen. Again, obviously, not much we can do about that in the home environment. Can't get rid of the oxygen. But the third thing it does require to grow and to reproduce is moisture. And this is where we come in as remediators and, of course, even as homeowners and office uh, landlords and so forth. We need to be able to control the moisture. It's kind of interesting if you, you, know, you look at the EPA uh, website, they don't have a whole lot to say about mold remediation, to be honest, because that's really not their lane. But what they are concerned with is helping the consumer to figure out how to deal with some of these challenges. And they have a pamphlet that they uh, allow people to download about controlling mold in their home environment. And really the, 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 the takeaway from the whole pamphlet is control the moisture. If we control moisture in a home, even though there are, there's mold spores present in small amounts, we shouldn't get that type of growth. So we, as remediators, not only do we use this information to say, okay, this is the, the cause of this mold outbreak, but it also helps us figure out what type of, a, we want to find what type of a water loss was this. Where is this water coming from? We need to get to the source of that moisture issue to find out what's really going on in this in this home environment. Now we talk or we hear a lot of people talk about the importance of species identification. Uh, you Google mold, for example, and Google is not always your friend. There is a lot of misinformation out there on Google as well. Uh, some some people out there have an agenda. They're trying to make money with scare taxes, uh, scare tactics, and so forth. I know none of us here do that, but, but it definitely happens. So there's, there's a lot of talk about species identification. So what I'd like to do is take a quick poll here uh, because one of the main ways uh, of species identification that we see used traditionally is through some type of mold sampling, which is usually an aerosol. So I'd like you to answer the poll question here before we can move on. Are you currently, and by you, we mean either yourself personally or maybe an industrial hygienist who you've worked around on some of your jobs or whoever's doing the testing, are they currently using AeroCell for mold sampling data? 
and, and why some of you are filling this out uh, reminds me of a of a uh, experiment that we ran at Goldmore. Uh, kind of, we were kind of concerned about some of the results didn't seem consistent with what we felt should be going on. So what the general manager Randy for Goldmore and, and I did, we took a, a home, a room that we knew was that we knew was contaminated, but uh, with mold. And so we did three aerosol samples in the same room, one right after another. So it took literally, you know, 20 minutes to take these three samples. But we labeled the cassettes, room one, room two, and room three. And then we sent them off to the lab. Now, again, this is no knock on any labs or whatnot. They just take the data that they have and they do the best they can. But they had no way of knowing these were all coming out of the same room. We got our results 24 hours later, whatever the turnaround was on that one. I think it was 24. And the report came back saying that we had aspergillus. Uh, in the one sample, about 33,000 parts per cubic meter, which if you know anything about aerial cell reports or mold sampling reports, that's a lot. The other, the next sample said it was 66,000. And the final sample said 92,000. So we had a 300% difference in the amount of mold that they were saying that we had, mold spores, uh, in the same room at the same time. Takeaway is not very accurate, to be sure. And so that's a cause for concern for us as we're using uh, different types of air sampling methods. That's the old technology. We'll talk in a few minutes about some of the new technology that we have for air testing, uh, but we want to certainly take those uh, samples with a grain of salt. And before we talk a little bit more about that, let's just see some results here on our poll. So it's pretty even split. Some of you are doing that already with aerosols, or you're at least familiar with them. Uh, you may already be having that used on some of your projects if an IH is doing it, and he may not even uh, be letting you know exactly how they're doing those tests. But that's pretty much the standard uh, in the industry to this point. So what's the problem with that? Well, the problem is that it's impossible to determine the species of a mold just by visual inspection. And that's basically what an aerosol cell report does. It has a little cassette, and as you may know, it draws air into that cassette where uh, the, the spores are supposed to impact that little slide that's inside that cassette. They send that off to a lab, they take a portion of that slide, they blow it up you know, on a microscope onto a screen to uh, show what's going on. Then they compare visually what they see on that slide with, well, we'll call this a cheat sheet of different molds. And they say, well, that one, you know, that looks like that, that looks like that. So it's a visual inspection. And yet you, we cannot really speciate that way. To, to really know the species of a mold would require some type of a live culture sample. And not only does that take a long time, usually one to two weeks, uh, but it's also typically cost prohibitive uh, for a customer. It's interesting if you go to a lot of these uh, very common labs and you look up the aerosol brochure, if you look at the small print, if you've never gotten one of these reports, it says you've got this, this species, this species, this species. But you look at the small print for the aerosols, even on those sites, and they will tell you the disadvantage is that fungi cannot be identified to species with this method. It's just not possible. So again, don't put too much credence in a, in a mold sampling report that says you've got a particular type of species. And is that even important? If you see mold in a home, you've got mold. It doesn't really matter to us what type of mold it is. I guarantee you, Mrs. Jones, she doesn't want, she doesn't care if it's basidio spores or cladosporium or, or whatever on her, on her wall, she doesn't want it there. We're going to remediate it the same way, no matter what it is. Uh, even the EPA it says that uh, pre-sampling uh, mold samples aren't required because, again, we can't do a speciation on it. So uh, just a point to keep in, uh, keep in mind there. Now let's talk for a minute about technologies, mold remediation technologies that are in place currently. Traditional mold remediation has basically been born out of the asbestos industry. Now, mold has been around forever. We know that, but it really didn't start becoming a real problem that we recognize in the home environment until the 1990s. And we might remember if we've been in the business a while, 
hearing back reports of uh, different lawsuits because of mold. You know, homes started getting tighter in terms of airflow. Just different things started contributing to being an issue. But when this started happening, and this was, you know, big dollars were floating around, but how do we do, what do we do with this? How do we remediate this? There was no protocol in place. And so basically this asbestos abatement protocol, which was in place, was adopted. What is that? Well, first of all, asbestos, as you may know, it's a mineral, but because of some of the properties that it uh, had or has, uh, they would take asbestos and incorporate it into building materials. But very fire resistance and so forth. Well, the thing about that asbestos and that building material, it's impossible to remove the asbestos because now they realize, oh man, this is a problem, child. Impossible to remove that asbestos without taking out the building material. So the protocol was always, and again, this is a very brief overview of it, but contain the area that you're going to do this removal in by setting up a plastic containment, what have you. Uh, full, P, full PPE is put on. We go in there, we, we take out that building material, bag it up so that we can dispose of it later in an approved facility, and we scrub and clean the air within that containment, get our clearance, and, and it's all done. So that's what was adopted for mold, and that's traditionally what's done. Building material was, would be removed, the air cleaned to the degree possible within that contained area, and supposedly everybody's good to go. But the problem is mold is not asbestos. First of all, it's a living thing. So we can't just leave it alone like you can with asbestos. It's, again, actively seeking out new environments. Also, mold is on the material. It's not part of the material. So why tear out the building material if it's not required? Remove the mold, not the material. This little picture here is a classic example uh, of this happening where in a bathroom, a master bathroom, a inoperative exhaust fan has led to a buildup of humidity over the weeks and months that this bathroom was being used, and we see all this surface mold. Well, again, rather than tearing everything out, it might take days, if not weeks, and quite a bit of expense for uh, the customer and the insurance company, whoever's involved. Uh, a simple treatment of 30 to 60 minutes, and it looks brand new. No painting done in this picture, that's just removing the mold. So that's the visible aspect of what we're trying to accomplish with our mold remediation. But what are some of the other issues at hand? Well, it's really all about air quality. Visible is fine, and we don't want to see that around us, but it is the air quality that can cause issues with uh, those that are living in the environment. Uh, we know there's there's particles in the air. If we can smell something, that, that's a particle. And so we have pollen in the air, we could have bacteria, virus, uh, we could have uh, pet dander, and we can have dust and mold spores as well. And the more of those contaminants that we have in the air, the less our air quality is, the poorer our air quality. So another poll question we'd like to ask then, we talked about air sampling for mold, well, what about actually figuring out particles? So our next poll question that we'd like to ask is, are you currently testing the air, or again, your IH or whoever's doing the testing, if you're not, are you currently testing for particle contaminants? And so if you could give us a yes or no on that as well, we'd appreciate it. Now, while, that's, uh, while you guys are filling that out, along this line of air quality, you know, we hear a lot about how uh, certain molds are, are toxic or produce mycotoxins. Again, if you go to Google, you're going to get a lot about toxic mold. And it's true. It's true. There's some molds that do produce toxins, uh, but only in certain conditions. And some molds, like aspergillus, some strains of it will produce toxins and others, others won't. And then there are some molds that don't produce it at all. And again, a lot of times it depends on the environmental condition that's at hand. So that brings the question to mind then, if we are leading, our marketing efforts are leading with mycotoxin, because we see that as a buzzword a lot now, do we even know that we're dealing with that? Uh, traditionally, there has been no way to even test for mycotoxins in the air. Now contrast that to particles in general. 
that's where the science is going. Particle count reading has been used for years in outdoor air quality assessment, but never really to a great extent indoors. Uh, but uh, recently, for example, at the uh, Healthy Home Summit, which they have every year, last couple of years has been in Philadelphia, is a, a summit where the, the real scientists in the industry get together, air quality scientists, as well as others in the industry. But the takeaway, we were at that last year, and the takeaway was really that any remediation, post-remediation testing that doesn't include particle testing really hasn't been done well. We have to measure those particles to see what the quality of our air is. So let's look at our results here. So again, not far from even, uh, how some are using particle contaminants or particle count readings. One of the challenges with particle count reading is, again, traditionally we've had raw data that we could use, but we've never really had a way to quantify that data into a meaningful report. And we'll talk about how that's a new technology, uh, technology that's available here in a couple of moments as well. So let's address this problem about air contaminants or particles in the air. We just watched that video a bit ago about the mold, mold spread. Once those spores start to break free and start moving around, they go throughout the building environment, whether it's a home or an office or whatever the case is. They can be circulated through the heating and cooling unit. Uh, the uh, HVAC unit is designed to draw in so-called fresh air uh, in one part of the house, maybe it's even in a crawl space or an attic where it's getting that fresh air, and that may be a contaminated area, and then it's sending that throughout the house. If mold spores are present, again, those are spread everywhere. Uh, carried on clothing. We can walk through a contaminated room or another facility and then bring those spores with us into this, uh, this environment. Airflow from open doors and windows. We talked about mold is ubiquitous. It's everywhere outside. Some days are worse than others, but every time we open a door or a window, we're going to begin to reintroduce those mold spores into the environment. The furniture can be another problem. Uh, I grew up in, the, in a dry area of the country, but now I've moved down to uh, Arkansas. It's a lot uh, more humid, and I found out quickly you put any furniture out in a storage unit, and it's no longer than a couple of weeks, and you've got a mold issue. Uh, or maybe you don't even realize it, maybe it's hidden, but then you bring that furniture back into your home, and again, you've infected uh, your environment. So it can be a, a huge issue. That mold is everywhere. Long before you and I arrive on that house, or to that house, as mold remediators, long before we get there, that mold has spread throughout the environment. So containment comes into play. Normally, containment is trying to keep stuff within the contained area. For us, it's more of this is the area we're going to be treating. So, for example, you see a picture of the containment here. That's typical uh, mold containment, perhaps, where the visible mold area is contained. But if that's what our containment looks like, then we've missed the boat to some degree. At Goldmore, we realize that any effective remediation protocol has to include whole house treatment. We view the whole house as our containment because again, those mold spores have spread everywhere before we ever get there. Now to illustrate that point, we had a, a experience where uh, Randy and I went out to teach a, a company, train a company with Goldmore that was in the Pennsylvania area. Really nice company, about seven employees. The owner was very proud of the type of work that they did, the type of clearances they got. Sometimes it took several weeks of air scrubbing and different things, but they would always get what they, they figured was a clean environment when they were done. They called us out because they were primarily uh, uh, interested in some of the, the, stain, the uh, stain remover products we have because they kept getting this black staining with mold and so forth. So we went out and trained them. They had a, a job that we went out into the field the following day on to help them with. It was a three-level house, very nice home, finished basement, first floor, of course, and then a second floor. The water loss had occurred in the basement. So they had already gutted the basement, basically, down to the studs, taking the floor covering out. They had a beautiful containment set up that went up the stairs and then plasticed off a corridor to the outside to take all the furniture out. So we got down in the basement. Before we started treating, we said, you know what? 
let's uh, let's test the air quality. And we'll talk about these uh, particle count readers here in a moment, but we have the ability to, with those particle count readers, to see what the air quality is in real time. We don't have to send off uh, to get a report at a lab. So we tested the air down there. Of course, we expected it to be contaminated because we hadn't remediated it yet, and it was. But then we said, well, you know what? Let's go upstairs to the main floor outside the containment. And we did that, tested it. Sure enough, it was drastically elevated. Not as high as the basement because that was the source of the mold, but still very elevated. Went up to the second floor, same thing, elevated. Well, we, we expected, Randy and I expected that to be the case because we appreciated those mold spores are spread everywhere before we got there. But the owner of that company was really pretty upset with himself because he realized that had we not shown him that, he would have gone about that remediation, got a clearance from an IH on that contained area in the basement, but really have left contaminated air in that individual's home. So it illustrates the importance of a whole house treatment. And then how do we know what our results are? This is where the particle count testers come in. A couple of pictures of them here. Again, they've been on the market for some time, but not used so much in an indoor uh, environment. Uh, these results that they produce, we can then get a report that is actually tied to international standards for what is and isn't clean air. The World Health Organization and the ISO, the International Standards Organization, have set up criteria for what constitutes clean air, and our reports will show both pre-remediation and post-remediation where this home lies in those standards. Uh, so it's a, a fantastic way to really see what's going on with our air. So now, so this is kind of the direction that technology has, is taking us where perhaps we don't need to remove all the building materials because molds on it, and we really want to address the air quality. So how can we achieve those kind of results? And that's where the Goldmore solution comes into play. Goldmore, we have three main products that touch on mold remediation. GM 2000, GM 6000 additive, and GM thermal. Don't expect you to remember the, the names, that's not important. What's important is these three products basically take care of our surface applications or visible mold, I guess we'd say, whether it's on a structure materials or even under, if it's on soft content, it could be on the, the upholstery or the, the, the curtains or fabrics or, or whatever that's in the home, we can remove the mold, for mold staining from that as well. And then it also takes care of that air scrubbing or airborne issue of those contaminants in the air. Now, we're concentrating on mold here, but it's also going to be removing other contaminants that we talked about, you know, dust particles, dander, uh, pollen, things of that nature, so that again, when we're done, we have clean, clean air. Let's look at an example of the, the products in action here a bit. First off, we're going to look at surface application. So visible mold in different type, on different types of surfaces and how the products can help us with that. So here's a typical attic in many parts of the country where you get a lot of humidity, not much ventilation, and you get this, this mold growth that just literally stains the wood. Typical remediation would take, and, and this was done by Randy's crew, uh, before he had Goldmore, it would take him four or five days, a couple of guys to get up there, either blasting it, wire brushing it, uh, doing whatever was necessary to get rid of that staining. With Goldmore, this is all live, vi live video, obviously, <laughs> Well, it's obvious to me, it's unretouched. That's what happens. You spray it on, in this case on wood, it soaks right in and gets rid of that staining and mold. Uh, you can do a tape sample, surface sample, whatever type of testing you want, there's nothing left present. So now a job like this, four or five hours for, two, for a couple of guys and a little bit of product. Imagine how many more projects your company can do in the same in the same amount of time, your, cust or your, your competition won't be able to compete with you, either on quality and certainly not on price because of the time, time involved. Here's a situation on uh, plaster or drywall where 
smooth surface, so it doesn't take near as much product just because of the velocity of the, of the surface. Just a little squirted on a, a mop head is doing this whole section. Again, just spreading it around, getting that product in contact with the mold, and it's, it's, it's gone. And then this final example is on drywall as well, a little rougher texture. Uh, and so in this application, you're spraying it on and then moving it around the sponge. Now you'll notice there's no residue on the sponge there. It's not as if you're wiping it off. It's basically dissolving it, getting down into that root structure and getting it all out. I've used the product since 2011, never had a colony uh, come back uh, that we've used the Goldmore product on. So again, ir irrespective of what the surface area is, uh, it may change how much we use in terms of the product, because again, a, like a wood product is, or excuse me, a wood surface is going to soak up more of the product. Uh, but uh, whether it's uh, wood or drywall, again, we have another one of those other products that we use on soft contents will get rid of that mold staining. All right, so that's the surface, that's visible mold. And again, whatever, it could be in a vehicle, it could be in someone's home. Uh, we've, we've done all different types of, of applications there. But then we have the air quality issue. How do we address the contaminants that are in the air? That is with our fogging solutions. We have two types. In the video, we see uh, the first type is a water-based uh, fogging agent. And this is a very quick video. And then the second one is a oil base that we use in a different type of fogger. Again, depends on the application, the job that we're on. They both basically do the same thing in terms of air quality, uh, but there are reasons we use different ones, uh, which we go over in our full training and so forth. It doesn't take long with a thermal fogger to fit, fill up a large volume space. Gymnasiums, industrial complexes, quick work we make of it with the thermal fogging agent, and it does a fantastic job on the final air quality. Now, those videos are pretty short. Unlike the visible mold, it's not real exciting to see, you can't really see what's going on because it's happening microscopically. But again, it's as if not more important than the visible mold, because it's those spores that are in the air that are gonna find other areas of the home and just wait for a moisture event to start a new colony. It's this fogging process that lets us take air quality like this on a free remediation test where every room fails, again, according to those international standards, to a post remediation clearance report where every room passes. And you'll notice the reduction column, huge reduction in the amount of, of spores and particles. Uh, that are present in that environment. So the end result, visually clean home, which is very important to our customer because that's the first thing they notice, but even more importantly, superior air quality. We've had just customer after customer after customer say that after the fogging process, I can't believe how much better my home is. I can breathe. I thought I had allergies, blah, 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 whatever. And those all may be true to the, to the point because all those contaminants can cause issues. The point is the Goldmore products leave our air clean the way it's supposed to be. So it truly is as uh, easy as one, two, three. Uh, apply the 6,000 for visible mold. We fog it with the GM 2000 and the thermal, and then we're able to get our clearances. Uh, most of our jobs are done the same day. So our customer can be back in the home that night or perhaps the next day at the most, uh, depending, upon, uh, depending upon the situation. So how do you get involved? Well, to get your Goldmore license, everyone that uses the product has to have a Goldmore license. We don't sell over the counter. We don't sell just product. This is part of the system. We're going to train you. We're gonna make sure you know how to use the product and we're gonna be there to offer ongoing support for you building the business, help with how to handle jobs, help with even how to bid jobs, just on an ongoing basis. We wanna be there to help you. You can go to GoldmoreUSA.com and go to Start Using the Goldmore System there tab, and you can fill out a no-obligation free approval application. 
We'll see what part of the country you are, see where we're at in terms of need on uh, technicians, and then you can get started uh, in that process of getting your Grow More license. Now, what we are offering today is a uh, webinar special. So our training that we do, everybody that uses the product goes through our online training. It's, it's conducted in a live webinar style setting, similar to this, but with far fewer people so we can really uh, interact. Everyone uses the product goes through that training. Normally, they don't go through that training until after they acquire their license. But to, for the webinar today, for the first 20 people that email me, if you would like, you can come to our training. It's a two-day, a three-hour session each day. We have one at least once, once a month. Our next one is December 12th and 13th. And the first 20 people can attend that and, and just kind of kick the tires, so to speak, and then decide from that point on if you want to get further involved uh, with Goldmore. So if you're interested in that, uh, send an email to Brett S. That's B-R-E-T, one T, S as in Salee, at GoMoreUSA.com. And again, I'll just take them in the order I get them, and then we'll get you, uh, get you lined up for that coming training. Well, that's basically it on the presentation. Now it's time uh, for questions and answers, so hope you have some, and we'll do our best to try to answer them. Sarah, if you want to take that away. Thank you, Brett, for a great presentation. And yep, we've had uh, questions coming in. Please continue to um, send your questions and we'll address as many as we can before uh, our hour is up. Um, but before I start asking Brett some of the questions that you've been submitting throughout the program, I wanna remind you that we love your feedback and our web on our webinar survey to help improve our program. Okay, now for uh, our first question. Uh, what other products are on the market that are similar to yours? Mm, that's a good question. Well, none, <laughs> to be honest with you. Uh, there are products out there that um, will claim to take care of mold staining. Uh, I've never used any of them. I've always used gold more since I started in mold remediation. I've talked to many of our techs. We have several hundred across the country that have used a lot of these products. And they said sometimes they would get results, sometimes they wouldn't. Uh, one of the big problems uh, with some products, especially that are bleach-based, is uh, it's all pre-mixed, and bleach has a terrible shelf life. So that by the time that you, the consumer, gets the product, uh, it's already lost its efficacy, its strength. And so no consistent result. Uh, oftentimes they still have to scrub. Um, if you're using a product right now where you get the type of results on a visual basis that you saw in those videos where literally it just disappears in seconds, and that does that every time with Gold More, then you've got a pretty good product. Uh, however, still have the airborne issue. Uh, again, I've never seen anything that will take out the particles that are in the air, uh, like the, our fogging agents, and also uh, neutralize the odors that, that are in the air. Good question, though. Okay, the next one is, uh, why are you assuming that the particles in the air are mold or dangerous? What if they just have a very dusty house? Yeah, great. I am not assuming that. Um, again, I don't, we don't use a lot of what, what I call scare tactics, so there's dangerous particles. I do know that it, whether it's dust or pollen or pet dander or, or mold, uh, particles in the air, it will create problems for some people in a respiratory way. For example, I'm very allergic to mold. If I get in a room that has mold, chest starts tightening up, my eyes start, you know, itching, uh, sinuses clog up, or my business partner, they have before, it didn't bother him at all. So I'm not assuming anything's dangerous, but particles in the air reduce air quality, period. If we reduce those particles down and we have, you know, ways with those machines to tell uh, you know, what kind of particles live in what micron sizes and so forth. We get those, uh, those particles down. We know we have cleaner air. And again, that's, that's backed up by the scientists. World Health Organization, international standards, you've got to get the particles down. Interestingly, those standards that were set up by those agencies and, and this whole, this whole uh, scale that monitors, you know, what, what level of room do we have, that kind of was born out of the pharmaceutical market. Uh, biochip, you know, uh, computer chips, biotechnology, where they have to have uber, uber clean air. <laughs> now, we're not trying to duplicate that. We can never do that without large laminar airflow filtration and so forth. 
but we can use that same scale to see where we fall in terms of our uh, residential uh, air quality. Okay, our next one is uh, what respiratory cartridge is required for the fog? Um, another good question. So most of us use the 3M uh, full face respirators and they have, I think it's, I'm just going off my memory, it's a 90363 cartridge. It's a vapor organic EP100 style uh, cartridge. Um, and the, the fogging agent is very non-caustic. It's been, and you can go to our parent company, a site at 21stglobal.com. You can see all the uh, skin testing that's been done and the biodegradability testing, um, very non-toxic. But having said that, we still use obviously the full PPE when we're doing our remediation. Okay, do you seal off the HVAC vents when um, you're fogging the room? Okay, good question. So a lot of states out there, 50 of them, and different states have different regulations. So you always, and, and we stress this in our training with any type of remediation, and this is what doesn't happen oftentimes, always wanna check your, your uh, local statutes and whatnot. For example, the state of Texas, they're very particular about what you can and can't do with HVAC and what you can and can't say. Uh, sometimes even require if you touch HVAC uh, that you have to have a license for HVAC. So, Ideally, yes, we want the air handling system running because, again, we want to circulate that air and the, the fogging agent throughout the home. Obviously, the mold spores and other contaminants have gone into uh, that uh, HVAC system, and so we want our fogging agent uh, as well. But we never want to give the impression, especially in those states uh, that are very sensitive to that, that we are uh, cleaning the HVAC system. That may require an HVAC license. You'll just have to check with your local authority on that. Okay, there were a number of questions that were kind of similar, basically all of them asking, is it really getting rid of um, everything that's deep behind the drywall or the materials that are behind the framing behind the drywall or the backside okay, of the great. drywall? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, we get that question a lot and it's certainly a valid one. You see some of those walls in those videos and that's the first thing we hear at trade shows. Oh my word, what about the, the wall cavity? Uh, so, First of all, common misconception about drywall. A lot of people feel that if you have a mold on one side, it, that that mold can grow through the drywall to the back side. That's not the case. Gypsum is a sterile environment. A mold can't grow through there. If you have mold on both sides of the drywall, it's because you had a water event on both sides. And, and that can happen, to be sure. If you have some kind of an overhead water loss, especially in an outside wall where the insulation becomes saturated, quite likely you could have mold growth in there. That's why I mentioned earlier, it's important to determine what was the source of the water event. If it's uh, something that's causing a uh, drastic increase in relative humidity in a room, like an ineffective exhaust fan, then it's typically just surface mold. Having said all that, we talk about investigative techniques in our training. Uh, there are ways we can look inside those wall cavities to see what's going on, to see if there is an issue before we just start ripping stuff out. So there are times when we have to remove structural material to get at the mold. The point is, once we get there, we don't need to take out the structural material just because it has mold on it. So that's the subtle difference. So don't mean to ever say that we'd ever take out drywall. Not the case. It's just that we find many of our jobs, especially in a home environment like those bathrooms, uh, where it's not required because it's all just surface mold that we've determined after investigation. Okay. And if the uh, if the jib board is paper is damaged, what happens when you wipe it? Okay, so good question. A couple of parts to that. I like your word damage. That's the key. That's water damage. As I'm sure we all know, water can cause structural material to degrade depending on how long it's sitting in that water or saturated. So if the material, if the structural material is damaged, well, Goldmore is not going to say that. If the paper is degraded probably needs to be replaced. If the plywood has begun to delaminate because it's been in water for so long, probably needs to be replaced, let alone issues like category three water, black water that it may have been sitting in, that brings in a whole nother issue. Uh, what we're talking about though is just mold that's on the surface and it's probably dug in a little bit in terms of the root structure, especially like we see it on that drywall and in the wood, but that can be removed if it hasn't already begun to damage uh, the product. 
or the structural material, sorry. Is your product uh, bleach based? Okay, no, great question. Uh, the GM6, none of our products have bleach in it. The GM6000, which is what we use for the stain removal on the uh, structural elements like wood and drywall, it is an additive that we mix on site with bleach. I, I was talking to one gentleman at one of the uh, experienced trade shows, and he, was, he had nothing to do with Goldmore, but he'd been in the industry for, for eons. And he's taught, we're talking, we got talking about bleach. He says, you know why? You know why people use bleach? And I said, I don't know why. He said, because it works. And bleach does work, but it has some big limitations. I already mentioned one of them. One of them is the shelf life. It starts to degrade immediately. So that's why pre-mixed products with bleach just are really problematic. We use uh, fresh bleach that you mix on site for the job at hand. Our products have a two-year shelf life, so you don't have to worry about it. We want to make sure it's nice and fresh. The other problem with bleach is it has a terrible dwell time. As soon as you put it onto something, it begins to evaporate long before it can penetrate into mold the root structure and really get it out. That's why if you've ever tried to put just bleach on mold, it'll take that top layer off, kind of like you know cutting the grass, so to speak, but it doesn't get to the root. And that's what the GM6000 does. It changes the viscosity of the bleach. It's a super wetting agent, allows it to penetrate into the root structure of that mold and get that stain out. Again, I've never had a colony uh, come back. I bet okay, the GM2000. Oh, I'm sorry. It just, I just thought to add, our fogging agents have absolutely no bleach in them, no caustic chemicals at all like that. We would never want to put anything related to bleach or, um, hydro or um, hydrogen peroxide, anything like that into a fogging agent uh, because you just can't get it out of the air. It's going to cause a, a dangerous situation for our homeowners. Okay, go ahead. Sorry. Okay, um, yep, no problem. Uh, how does the remediation ventilation affect the pre-remediation and post-remediation testing? How does it affect it? Well, if yep. I understand your question, um, it affects it in a positive way. So pre-remediation, obviously, uh, we, we, we probably aren't going to be doing this job unless there was a problem. So uh, pre-remediation testing shows uh, either visible mold or colony growth by a tape sample or some type of surface sample or some type of air quality issue. We do our remediation. Post-remediation, we're going to get clean results, whether it's, again, surface sampling by tape. A lot of IHs, one of their main tools they use is visual. Uh, obviously, all the visual mold is going to be gone, and then we feel, uh, very importantly, any air quality tests, again, whether performed by an IH or, or you as the remediator, are going to come out clean as well. If we don't get the result, and if you as a Goldmore technician going down the road, if you don't get the result that, you, that we have come to expect on a job, something went wrong. Something was missed, and that we're all human. It happens to all of us. But we're going to help walk you back through it, figure out what the issue was. Why didn't we get these results? And that's one of the big differences between just buying a product off of the shelf and being part of the Goldmore family, because we're going to continue to be there to help, you know, troubleshoot these issues and so forth. But 99 times out of 100, you're going to get those, those clearances immediately. Okay, this was a viewer who said they're not yet um, counting the particles, but do you have a suggestion of a particular brand or model for, of particle counters? <laughs> Uh, yes and no. Um, there's some good ones out there. Uh, it it kind of depends what you're going to do with them. So particle count readers themselves, they give you data, raw data, uh, when you use them. Now, depending upon the unit, they measure different micron sizes of particles. But that raw data in and of itself doesn't mean a whole lot to most of us because it's just numbers. And there's never really been a way to take those numbers and then parlay that into some type of a report that will substantively tell us what's the, what's the air quality like. And that's what we now have available through, uh, for Goldmore technicians through IAQ Analytics. It takes those particle count readings, runs them through, an, through algorithms, ties them into those international standards, and gives us a report. Now, to do that, now that's where you have to have a certain type of particle count readers. And by type, I just mean it has to be measuring certain channels. Some of the better machines, which are the ones that we use, 
measure six different micron sizes. We have to have that in order to use it with that reporting structure. There are cheaper uh, particle count readers out there that might measure one or two or, or three channels. And while that does give some type of a benchmark, we really can't tie it to any standards that way. So, so it's kind of a yes, there are some better. X-Tech, probably one of the least expensive on the market. If, if you've been in the business for any length of time, you're probably familiar with X-Tech. They make a variety of water mitigation tools, moisture meters, so on and so forth. They were bought out by FLIR or, or, or vice versa. I can't remember which. And they have an X-Tech VPC 300, which a lot of our guys are using. Uh, we also have a new line on them. Uh, straight out of China. X-Tech is made in China. We have another brand that's coming over from China that we're going to start using more because of the cost differential. Uh, so, yeah, those are just a couple. Oh, did I lose someone? Nope, sorry. Um, I said, going okay. back to uh, more questions on the particle reader, how do you use the numbers on the particle reader? Well, just as I mentioned, you have to be able to tie into the reporting structure. Uh, that's a, the, the one we use is ava only available to Goldmore technicians that take that raw data, they put into a website, algorithms are set up in the background that take those international standards that have been set, set and print out a report with a scale on it. Uh, again, that's in real time. I'm out there on a job site, I'm taking particle count readers, I type in those numbers into this reporting structure. I can immediately spit out a PDF or email that PDF to Mrs. Jones. I don't have to wait 24, 48 hours to get a report back from the lab. I can get it to her immediately, which is really going to help me to get the job, obviously. So you need to have that reporting structure to really make it informative to yourself and to your client. Outside of that, you're basically just going with the machine. Um, and saying, well, that's pretty good, but it's kind of almost like mold sampling with the aerosols. There's really no standard, so you have no way of really saying, yeah, this is clean air or not. So that's the challenge with with, with using them in general. Okay. okay. Um, Brett, there are a couple of questions coming in about IICRC and S520 wanting to know um, is this, how is it how is it related the standard yeah. and your product so yeah yeah great question that's very important get that a lot that's probably one of the top three for sure uh gold board does not go against the iicrc now here's what i at, uh, or ask or encourage people to do when they ask a question like this is make sure that you have read the iicrc uh s520 on mold remediation because so often it's just human nature. We hear someone says something to us. Well, the EPA says this, the ICRC says this. You owe it to yourself as a business person to go see what it really says. For example, I have one slide here that I printed out or took a uh, a shot of from the S520. And pardon me to read on my screen, but notice part I highlighted. It talks about contamination removal of mold in the S520. And this is just one sp one spot. It, it has similar language throughout. Physical, uh, physically removing mold contamination is the primary means of remediation. That's what we're doing. We're removing the contamination, which is the mold colonies. Goes on. Mold contamination should be physically removed from the structure, systems, and content to return them to condition one. You can't return something to condition one if you tear it out. So we are returning we're removing the contamination and returning these structures, these systems, and these contents to condition one, which means mold, basically mold free. So we have no issue with the IICRC. It's a uh, body of standards, which are great uh, for us to use in the remediation business. It's also a body of standards that are revised on a regular basis. They're putting out a new one. I talked to a couple people on the board, uh, and they hope to have it out yet here in 2019 and you'll see even more um, verbiage that talks about removing uh, the, the mold colonies and so forth we'll see how exactly that's worded but throughout the book and i, and I invite you to, to look through it if you see anything that you, you you're wondering about give me an email um, i've looked through it repeatedly and 
Goldmore works fine with IICRC standards. Hopefully that okay. Um, so I'm sorry. Lots of questions still coming in. We're going to get to as many as yeah. we can in the next five minutes. <laughs> um, sure. Does your company utilize outside IH resources on larger product projects? So that's really dependent upon uh, your area. Now, again, we always encourage our companies, we want to follow uh, any statutes that are in place, and those vary greatly from state to state. Uh, some states require a third-party IH to be on a job, or sometimes maybe once an IH is involved and then they have to continue that through the process, other states have absolutely no legislation about that. So. We, I can't know every state. I know some of the states, like Texas, being one of the more stringent ones and how it works there. And we have no problem working with uh, the IHs. Uh, they call them something else. They call them some type of consultant down there. But we have no problem working with um, Goldmore with these IHs. Uh, it's all about education. This is new technology. I've had many conversations with IHs who were initially skeptical. But once we talked to them about it, they said, okay, let's go ahead and do it. And when they saw the results, they were won over to a great degree. I mean, it's just, they loved it. Because ultimately, hopefully, we're all after the same thing. We want a clean home visibly, and we want clean air quality, and that's what Goldmore uh, accomplishes. So, but if kind of inside that question, we don't have anyone we, uh, we work directly with as an IH, uh, because that's not our lane but we can work with any IHs that are out there that the customer may get or insurance company or what have you. All right. Okay. Yep. Um, are the Golden War products considered a pesticide? Ooh, great question. Pesticide. So that brings in the EPA. I love the EPA. Spend some time on the EPA website if you have insomnia. Uh, there's a lot of information there, but that's what it takes to really understand what's going on. The EPA does not... Um, does not tell us how to do mold remediation, like we mentioned earlier. What the EPA does in relation to mold is they require products that have a kill claim, in other words, products that claim to kill a pest, to be registered as a pesticide. Now, the problem with that is, that sounds like a good thing, but the problem with that is, is if you use those products that are registered as a pesticide, then oftentimes in many states, that triggers the need for you to have a pest, uh, pesticide applicator's license. We had a technician in one state that had nothing to do with Goldmore products. He was using another product that was EPA registered, and his, his state uh, pest control board fined him $4,500 for using that product. It was a cleaning product, but it was registered, and so that meant it was registered as a pesticide, and he was fined. So be careful what you're using. Goldmore products are not EPA registered as a pesticide because that's not what they are. We don't want them to be registered that way. They're very green products, and we don't want that kind of label uh, on them. Hopefully that answers that. So how soon can occupants move back into a fog space or home? Okay, good question. So three, four hours uh, after we fog, Mrs. Jones can bring Fluffy home and everybody's good to go. Uh, yeah, three to four hours is typical. Now, a lot of times people ask us about, well, what's it gonna smell like? It's gonna smell clean, uh, like any clean home. It's not gonna have a lingering, terrible bleach odor that the fogging agent helps neutralize uh, that odor. Uh, some people, if they're uh, extremely sensitive, as soon as that three or four hours open, you can open up the windows, open up the doors, but they may stay overnight. But three to four hours is, is what we usually go with, and uh, I've had tremendous success with that. Okay. Um, does the fog leave a film on glass or materials? Mm. No, it doesn't. It doesn't. We have two fogging agents. One's water-based, and we typically use that in a residential environment uh, because of it being water-based. One is oil-based, which is, again, typically, more for uh, commercial buildings, very large volume buildings. We did one job down in Houston, which was a gymnasium. We had, had glass in it. It had brand new finished polished floors, and we fogged the heck out of that thing with an oil-based fog, but it is a dry fog, and I, to be honest, I almost expected there to be a little bit of a residue 
Not a bit. Not not anything on the glass, anything on the computer, anything on the floor, nothing. So, no, it won't leave a, a residue. The water-based one, I mean, we're not going to go right up the glass and saturate it, uh, although it wouldn't necessarily hurt it, but it is a water base. So if you put your hand, your glove in front of the, the spout, you're going to get it wet. So we just use some common sense there. But, no, it won't leave a residue. Okay, well, we've just hit our 3 o'clock mark, so that's all the time we have oh. for questions today. And well, there are a few more, so yeah. that's what I was going to say. If you have it, if your question was not answered, please feel free to um, email Brett and make sure you're one of those first 20 to be able to take part in his offer. Um, please join me also in thanking Brett Saley for his presentation, as well as our sponsor, Goldmore. And if you have ad additional questions or comments, you can either email Brett or please don't hesitate to click email us button on the console. Please visit rnrmagonline.com webinars for the archive of this, pre this presentation, as well as information about our upcoming events. We appreciate your time and hope you found this webinar to be a valuable experience. Thank you for joining us today. Thanks, everyone.